most of the prairie in Minnesota and the rest of the United States is pretty well wiped out. We've got less than 1% of uh, native prairie still remaining in this state. Um, so this book um, started with the idea that I would find in the archives of the Gale Research Library, which is in the Minnesota History Center, evidence of settler women writing about the prairie. And I failed on that front, so my whole project had to take, <laughs> take a new direction, and I ended up making up their voices um, for a variety of reasons. And the, you know, in the Q and A, if you wanted to hear more about that, you could. Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, the the poem, the book includes a variety of sequences of poems. Some of them are just called Prairie Daughter, and these are the the poems in which I sort of give voice to imagined settler daughters who are 16 or 17 years old. And they are dated. So the first one is 1836, and the last one is 2036. So here's the first one of those. Mama dressed us all in red gingham in case we wandered off into blue stem and grandma, and how would she have found us then? better to bell us. Some days the sky is high as firmament, others clouds waggle at us, their chins lowering to scrape the soil like Papa does, his stubble on our cheeks. Mama tied the smallest to the granary door, that one mules in the sun and mules in the shade. Truth is we run into the grass to get free of complaint and woe. Papa turns us inside out for animalcules, quotes from proverbs as he does. Sunday he baptized three Indians, wrote their names in the book, though he could not say the names. One a baby ripe with crying, one a man in a shirt white as glory, one a woman who never left off pulling her fingers along her blouse's hem as if she were keeping time or counting out sins. Anyone, Papa says, can find their way. How long could a body turn aimless in that high grass? So here's a uh, Prairie Daughter, 1862. I didn't hear Papa arrive in the night. Where he'd been, he didn't tell but apologized for the state of his clothes. Then he and Mama went, to get at, get, went out to get eggs and talk, and I thought to follow, to eavesdrop, but something kept me back. High sun for wash day, the blackbirds with red patches chattering overhead, just like the smalls when they get up in a tree. How do you get blood out of clothes? I asked Mama back when my monthlies came. Afterwards, my hands red and raw from the lie, Papa's clothes on the line, and all the rest too, I lay down under the cottonwood, old Deuteronomy, Mama called it. I had no prayer, no wish, only an ugliness inside and a fear and something else, not homesickness, for I was at home, but an itchy longing for somewhere else. Don't go off where you can't see the house, Papa said and said again. Don't wander, there's no telling, though he doesn't name it. Fee, fi, fo, fum, the smell of blood, the stiff places in his sleeves and on the knees, as if he'd knelt in another's spilling. Perhaps he did. My knuckles hurt. Someday, when I'm picked clean, someone will throw them to know the future. It will be an emptiness and a fright. Mm. So, um, another sequence of the poems uh, in this book are, are found poems. So, I, I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to to dig around in archives, but it's kind of thrilling. It's sort of like Christmas. You fill out a little slip of paper and drop it in a box, and then 
uh, after a little bit, here comes somebody with a cart and a box or two on it, and then you open the boxes, and there's something in there that you knew you wanted, but lots of stuff you had no idea, so I made many wonderful discoveries, uh, some of them um, terrible, and this is, I guess, one of those. December 7th, 1894, a found poem. Dear Sir, in closed, please find report of death, a child of Mr. and Mrs. John C. Thresh machine on place, run over by tank man. The boy died after three weeks, or on the 16th November. But Mr. C. has not buried his boy yet. Now, doctor, would you please inform me whether the Board of Health can act in this matter and how to go on? Truly yours, William G. Town Clerk. And then the following poem is me speaking in a way, I guess. Mrs. John C., was it you keeping the boy above ground? Was he your first, your last? the one scarlet fever passed over? How gold the wheat on threshing day and all the men come out in white shirts. Were you cutting potatoes, rolling dough? Were you elbow to elbow with the thresher's wives? Or could you not reason with your John? The boy was gold on threshing day and fully ripe. You had to feed the men. How could you send them home? How could you go on? and apples from the side yard and cabbage and the first of the cider. The boy was white on threshing day, white as late autumn cloud, as water from the well and coal. So here's, um, here's another, um, yeah, here's another Prairie Daughter poem. This is 1916. All morning nearly I played the Victrola and sewed between turning over the records. Do you guys remember those record players? Some of you do. Okay, cool. Be 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 <laughs> I'm gonna start over. All morning nearly I played the Victrola and sewed between turning over the records. New sleeves of Georgette crepe to that old green dress. Papa said made me look more fawn than human. We couldn't get a letter from him at all, the way he was straight-jacketed, Mama claimed. Beastly cold. The singing heated me up, though there was no explanation for it unless my heart tripping warned, warmed my extremities. A silly word for arms and hands, feet, toes, as if all those were afterthoughts. Being bound into canvas must make fingers foreign, the body liable to mundane corruptions. Oh, Papa, oh, Papa. The morning passed and lunch with Mama, and though it was clear, no one came all afternoon, too cold to call and lonesome. It turns you inward the long afternoon. Mama read aloud a while before we went to bed. In the night she rose and went to bed, went bed to bed, touching all of us, her hand cold as moonlight. So it's kind of a myth that it was mostly women from the prairie who ended up in um, mental hospitals, asylums, as they were called in those days. And mostly it was the men, I think, because they were out alone in the fields. Um, that's my hunch, based on no evidence whatsoever. <laughs> Here's another found poem. Dear Mama, I can tell you I have the real recipe a friend's sister got from her doctor after she'd had four. One pound cocoa butter, one ounce common boric acid, one and a half ounce tannic acid in a saucepan over hot water. The cocoa butter will melt. Pour half inch thick in a pie pan, cool and cut in half inch squares like fudge. Smells good enough to eat. Before each time, put one of those pieces up there. It will melt in a minute or so. These absolutely won't harm. Uh, right, did you 
you catch on what that's about. Um, contraception. It blows my mind that women had things like tannic acid and boric acid just, you know, under the sink in the kitchen <laughs> that, they could, that they could mix together, but it seems to be uh, the case. Um, here's, uh, here's a poem um, that Actually, I have a really sweet piece of news about this poem. This is a sad poem, I need to say that, but the sweet piece of news is that a fabulous composer named Jennifer Higdon is setting this for chorus. So I'm really thrilled about it, but it is a sad poem. It's called Around the Absence of Blue Stem. So there are two kinds of blue stem that are native to the prairie, little blue stem and big blue stem. Um, and uh, so that is one of, of course, one of the plants that's um, gone. It's 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 not all the way gone. We see blue. I saw a lot of blue stem driving here today, actually along the highway. Um, but this poem has as an epigraph. Uh, I was listening to the radio after the Virginia Tech shooting, and they were interviewing one of the fathers of one of the young people who was killed there, and he said this: "Everything has to arrange itself around that absence." I had to pull over because I was done in by by that. I mean, this idea that you know grief would cause you to rearrange your life in this way. Anyway, so this is called "Around the Absence of Blue Stem." Around the absence of blue stem, at the one-eyed top of a silo, a turkey buzzard preens and waits. Around the absence of blue stem, we have arranged lines and angles in four square order. We have metered spring and laid the coils of tile to pull what's too much off the land. Around the absence of blue stem, we have mowed the nests of marsh wrens and the monarch larva and the painted turtle. We have mowed the painted turtle. And we have laid tar and we have laid concrete around the absence of blue stem and around the absence of pasque flower and pacoon and vervain. We have arranged ditches easy to mow and black tops striped and gouged. And thus we are kept in line, ordered as commodities, pinched and blunted and dulled and spent. I'll just read one more. This is a poem that's just called Midden. Um, it is made up of names of flowers that, do, that, that are still around um, happily. And it also has an epigraph. This epigraph comes from a poem by a poet named Noor Hindi. Uh, her poem was published in a poetry magazine not too long ago. She said, colonizers write about flowers. So this is called, <laughs> do you know that poem? This is called Midden. Fire wheel, bear grass, fire wheel, bear grass, fire wheel, bear grass, fire wheel. Prairie gentian, bear grass, fire wheel, prairie gentian, iron weed. Fire wheel, iron weed, fire wheel, iron weed, bee balm, bee balm, bee balm. Black-Eyed Susan and Black-Eyed Susan and Sweet William, Sweet William. Compass plant, bear grass, bee balm, bee balm, bee balm. Compass plant, blue jacket, compass plant and compass plant and compass plant. Compass plant and compass plant and compass plant and compass plant and com compass plant and blue jacket. Windflower, indigo bush, butterfly weed, windflower, indigo bush, butterfly weed and blue-eyed grass, and blue-eyed grass, and blue-eyed grass, and blue-eyed grass. Sweet William, black-eyed Susan, blue-eyed grass, and crowfoot violet. Stiff tick seed, 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 stiff stiff tick seed, I feel like pulling it off myself. Harlequin, blue flag, hoary pacoon, pearly, everlasting, hoary, Pacoon, prairie, pearly, everlasting, ironweed, blue jacket, prairie flax, bee balm, bee balm, bee balm, American pasque flower, American, American, American pasque.
glass of flour. Indian paintbrush. Paintbrush, 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 Indian paintbrush, downy painted cup, white beard tug tongue, wood lily, and bee balm, bee balm, bee balm, prairie larkspur, prairie gentian, yellow prairie flag, prairie flox, prairie, 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 prairie. Prairie, prairie, prairie. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, one of one of the great things about writing poetry is you get to play with with language. It's a it's a holy sacred play, um, and you, you do it so well. And and yet you touch touch all of us with your your insights. Um, so I want to thank you all, beautiful people, for being here. I know you have choices, um, what you can do with your spare time, and I'm just so glad you're all here. Um, and I want to thank all the folks at Majors and Quinn. I hope you support them with your purchases, not just tonight, but in the future and often. So as my biography states, I grew up on a small 91-acre dairy farm in southern Minnesota. 11 years ago, when my parents retired from farming, my youngest brother asked if I would be a farming partner with him. And I said, yes, um, as long as we convert it to an organic farm, which we did. Um, and I quickly learned that running a farm is a whole lot different than just growing up on one. Every day is a huge learning curve. So tonight I'll be reading from my book, Until the Kingdom Comes. Specifically, I'll be reading uh, the book Sequence Poem. And a sequence poem is essentially a series of short poems that are uh, thematically connected. It tries to look at a theme, in my case, farmland, from different perspectives. We have art, Nietzsche said, so that we shall not be destroyed by the truth. The first time Frank called me, it was to say he wanted to buy my land and began unfurling his plans to start a canine center, a dog track, and an indoor water park. You wouldn't think, he said, that water parks are a gold mine, but water parks are a gold mine. Look at Wisconsin Dells. You ever been to Wisconsin Dells? See, so you know. That's where the professional athletes and their kids all go. Frank could have been an NBA player if it weren't for his friggin' heart. He could do a left-handed layup make a basket from downtown. He wanted to build some other kind of theme park too. Not sure what yet. He lived in and worked out of his RV, debt free, thank God. I'm just like everyone else around here, he said. I work, I've always worked. And if I didn't, Pops got the belt out and beat my butt. I'm not afraid of anything, Frank said. It was the second time he called, not to pressure me, well, maybe just a little but really just to talk, so I just listened. Say I got into a fight with a, fart, a shark, Frank said. Sure, I might end up with a colonoscopy bag or whatever, but I'd fight a shark. I'd say, bring it on, shark. Yeah, Pops was a yeller, user of the F word, and loved gas station beef jerky. <laughs> he died just after the Soviet Union did. I swear I didn't see it coming, Frank said. Yelling is the mark of an emperor, the self-crowning kind. Someone who can't tell the difference between love and war. Potholes. Walls. People. We keep running into them. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why this skin prickling in mortal expectation, this leading me to your bed, this hips tilt, this sad, sad, dumbly eloquent heart in the hand? Why isn't the world better than it is? What is the ache within an ache? What do we really want when we love the trees or picking apples with our mothers? What is the something that doesn't ever get solved in being human? The third time Frank called, he said through bites of apple, it'll be done the right way once I buy your land. I'll dig up all the field stones. It'll cost a couple of G's. Sheesh, there must be 99,000 rocks in your fields. Rocks, mud, and flies. How do you people live like that? 
He said, I'll hire 500 people and grease the politicians. They'll say, oh, Frank, I know him. Frankie owns Blue Earth County. I want to do business with Frank, or whatever. I'll say to the politicians here what I said to the politicians in Duluth. Guys, I got a hypersonic jet in Winnipeg. What do you got around here for an airstrip? Politicians can hook you up with movers you don't know how to shake. I am surrounded by feedlots, CAFOs, LJ Bloom, global farmers entrenched in the status quo. They call me interesting. I just want to be alone. There are things I want to talk about with Frank, but can't. How we're still only half awake in a fake republic. How we have conjured away our history through bullet, ballot, slashing, burning, not to mention bullying the world as if humans were only one animal among many. Our lamentable habit of loving too late. I want to say to Frank, Pollution has made our skies shabby, drab everywhere, for centuries to come. Our eyes once knew a depth of blue, now only found in literature, art, with our eyes closed in our dreams. We are shaped by our circumstances and our landscapes. I am Minnesota River Valley. My creeds come from here. My word choices, my philosophies, my ideas of beauty, my barbaric yawp. If you are the unsure type or into marketing or you just like stability, I'll tell you right now, I don't fit into any one box. I wouldn't for too long. What's more, I have irreconcilable differences. That's what I get for growing up in a tornado belt. I'm from where the weather doesn't care if you're walking with a prosthetic, what you owe the bank, how many miles you get to the gallon, or if you're turned inside out and hanging with your heart dangling though attached. Work is my destiny. Everything else is just showing off. I love my body rising with friskiness and heat. I'll love you frontwards and backwards or in the middle of some equinox storm. Though mine eyes have seen the glory I follow my own vision. I believe in blue earth, mystery, gravel roads, bailing hay and saints, holy water and sweet corn, love, all love divine, hopping trains, the clarinet polka, mayday, and newborn anything. This is the question we live with. How do we find beauty in a broken world? The terror in our own families it's daily. Can we at least be honest, skillfully and gracefully honest? Let us give each other our word that we will be honest because what we are all up against is cliche. We stereotype those with whom we don't agree. Media outlets stereotype us all, but we are families. These are our relationships. I am shaped by North Country. 6,500 rivers, 11,000 lakes, year-round weather, and the American farm family I grew up in. There is always a flurry at the door, the swish of thrown off chore clothes. We have family suppers, large family suppers, and no one agrees. We are direct. How to make peace with our conflicts. There have been many deaths in my family as there have been in other families. How do we find beauty in death? Let us begin by acknowledging the inexpressible pain of parting. And then let us find refuge in change and in what endures the four seasons, the waning and waxing of the moon, our eternal intervenings. We are resilient, we adapt. Through change, we do grow. Conversations can be engines for change, but it is difficult. Sometimes the room grows crowded with risky hanging slabs of dialogue, locutions bent and heaved, meals finished in gifts, hift, the crooked elegance with which we try to stick them in. I watch BBC, listen to NPR, 
and read the New York Times. An aunt refuses to watch Fox News because it's too liberal. She wants to know how her son, who moved to Buenos Aires, can use the pronouns they, them, we, and us. I don't understand, she says. Help me understand. Our response to catastrophe is often bewilderment, whether in families or across entire countries. COVID glides in on owl's wings during a vulnerable time in America. Science and wearing masks become political. The president dares the virus to touch him like Lear raging against the storm. More than one niece refuses to eat meat. Scenes of eruption, Pompeii, Herculaneum, Krakatoa recur. Buckled lips, contractions of syntax, collapsed nouns, the lacerations are dashes inflict. In the absence of the ordinary sutures of language, tranquility vanishes, ellipses prevail. I love my slew of brothers, cousins, aunts, uncles, and in-laws, but we can't honestly know how Native American farmers feel, I say, or how black farmers, brown farmers, or how Hmong farmers feel. We don't know. Empathy fatigue may be a thing. It is also a privilege. There's that word again, privilege. Family members walk out. I'm sorry. But this is where we are. Maybe we'll talk again tomorrow. Maybe we won't. I know they feel badly. I feel badly. How do we do it? How do we keep talking? Maybe we don't have the words, the scholarly vocabulary, or elegant persuasion skills of great orators past. Maybe we just don't want to get into it. I don't know how to do this. Just know we shouldn't give up. Let us embrace, like Gertrude Stein, what it feels like to stand in the vitality of struggle. Let us think of dignity, kindness, harmony, safekeeping, tenderness, and joy as a matter of will once the egos are shed. And while we're at it, let us praise Gwen Westerman, Rachel Carson, Louise Erdrich, and Terry Tempest Williams, for they are good. It is right to give them thanks and praise. Let us embrace hope. Otherwise, I don't think we can go on. Nature teaches all. Some animals will come right up to you. They have no fear. What would that be like if there wasn't any fear? Beauty can bind us all. Beauty in nature is the origin of awe and wonder. Just once, give animals the right of way. Stop whatever it is you're driving. Get out of your seat. Bow. Earth has a pulp. It registers all. Robins, rising pine, beetles in a scurry, the shed skin of snakes, every human voice. Scientists with their seismometers proclaim what indigenous wisdom has always known. Earth is alive. It is our turn to listen, honor, and behave on and with the land we call home. The old deed to my land is haptic. I can feel the print with my fingers. I cannot bring myself to burn it. Instead, I commit the world as it is to the flame and commit that to the soil. I commit to the ring of life linking me to the dead and the not yet living. To Mother Earth, please look to this place from which my farm flows, to the iron of spilled blood in the loam. Look to me, to those I have wronged, to those who have wronged me. Help me farm for tomorrow, the restitute for yesterday, and work for a blue sky, I hope my babies will live to see. The last time I talked to Frank, he came at me all nostril and horn. What do you mean you don't want to sell your land to me? You haven't even heard my other theme park idea yet. Frank and I were sitting in Baker Square. He scraped off the whipped cream from his French silk tie. 
You ever been to Universal Studios, he asked? They recreated dinosaurs freaking out over earthquakes, lava, and whatever running down their legs because of the friggin' volcanoes, which got me thinking. I'm gonna dig a bunch of trenches, and I'm gonna teach people what their great-grandparents or their great-great-grandparents went through during World War I. Trench warfare and shell shock. So when you go down into the trenches, it's gonna feel like you're being attacked. I'm talking bombs, cannons, tanks, mustard gas, and it'll feel real, trust me, because the trenches will be shaking. And then there's gonna be a laser light show. I can't believe you're saying no to this. In the end, Frank ate the scraped off whipped cream anyway. He said, I think Pops would have liked my idea too. I still always kind of miss him. Thank you very much. the nameplates and get my signature and just put it on any old book. <laughs> 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 well, I had a question for you. It's great. Right. So you said in the beginning that you had this idea to research people living on the prairie and it, it didn't work out. What exactly did not work out? Well, what I discovered is that women were keeping any kind of records at all or keeping records of the weather and what they baked and <laughs> who was sick and when the doctor showed up. <laughs> like that. My mom did that when I was six years old. So. Yeah, no, I mean I, I looked at I looked at letters and journals from the fifties and sixties. Oh, I mean it's just I mean I don't know if it would be different if I were looking at writings of men. I have a hunch probably not. And perhaps this is why nature writing is a kind of category in and of itself is that most people aren't walking around in the natural world going you know that's a bumblebee and that's a you know whatever hornet or paying attention it's a hard fact i don't know that's my hunch that surprises me <laughs> it did me too I mean, even, but if, even if he said oh it took us forever to clear the passage mm -hmm. of those bullets yeah. you know, or dig up this In the Gale, like the Gale Where's Research the Library in the Minnesota History Center. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I, I read other stuff to get that here. I just really looking at primary sources. Is that where you found the found poem? It, like you would request something and they would give you more? Can you just, just talk more about that? Yeah. Um, so the, of course, like so many libraries, everything's digitized, so the card catalog's digital. And um, uh, and, and things are cross-referenced, so I would catch wind reading this entry of something else that might be interesting, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then I would look for that thing. Um, and so in that way, I, 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 I found stuff that I might not have been able to find just using search terms. Um, but the other thing which I um, mentioned briefly is, so let's say I wanted somebody's yearbook. Like I looked at a lot of school yearbooks, which are a rich source of interesting stuff. Um, so it, that's only one small thing, and it might be in a box of all the stuff belonging to Mrs. John Doe, right? Okay. And, um, and, then, and then you just, and then you, I have access to everything else in the box. And that is often where I found um, some beautiful things. Yeah. Like I'd read about dance cards. Don't we all know what dance cards are? Have any of you guys ever actually seen a dance card? Mm -hmm. You yeah. have? That's cool. Well, I never had. Like I knew what they are because I'd heard about them, but I'd never 
looked at one or held one in my hand, you know, and this one was like a mimeographed um, little piece and every name of the dance, all the names of the dancers were in one column and then there were blanks and then you would go around to all the guides and say, you know, would you dance with me? Or the guide would come to you and say, can I dance with you? <laughs> and then they would, yeah, a specific one. And the most desirable thing, so you dance like six or seven dances, then there'd be lunch. I mean, this would be like 10 o'clock at night or eight o'clock at night or whatever. Um, and then you'd break for lunch. So the most desirable thing to, would be to get the dance before lunch because then you could escort the girl of your dreams and sit with her while you ate sandwiches. How great would that be? <laughs> And I mean, now school yearbooks, you know, they're all published by some big publishing house that gives the high school a, a template of every page, right? And you don't actually have to do anything. But turn of the century uh, yearbooks were all handmade. Everything in it was created by the students themselves and they are delightful. They're witty, they're, they're just delightful. Did you run into any, I guess I would, I would call it uh, social notes that you still have in small town newspapers where uh, Mrs. Jameson received her cousin from Mankato and they had lunch and did you, did you run into stuff like that? Because that kind of chronicles what's going on in totally, the area. Totally, yeah. No, for another project I did not poetry related, I was digging around in the 1940 newspapers from where I live in Western Minnesota. And there was a little social note that said, um, John Anderson was seen leaving the county to the north. <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked in later newspapers to find out if he'd returned <laughs> and there was no report his return. But I'd, uh, yeah, but those, I did not consult newspapers for this project, but yeah. Yeah, I love those. I love that. My town has that, yeah, Donnelly right. Township. That's, yeah. It's kind of an exalted position at the paper to be the, the, the social editor. Yeah, yeah <laughs> actually our social editor, this is interesting. Oh, okay, we're going off track here. But this, <laughs> this guy's like a devoted Republican and whenever I'm a devoted Democrat, so if there was ever like a rally downtown, he would show up and film everybody but he was the social editor for the Donnelly Township News and it was exactly like that. You know, who, who came to visit, who, mm -hmm. right, whose relatives had died or whatever had happened, yeah. yeah. Jean, are the other sections of your book also themed from different perspectives? Um, like it, it kind of flows from, you know, you grow up on a farm, you leave home, you live abroad a couple back and and there's this flood of childhood memories that you've really forgotten about because you're back there in that space so there are some childhood memories um, and specific relatives were influential to me um, I'm fortunate to have a lot of um, good strong women in my life but if, if I am a poet it's because of the, the men in my life my my grandfathers and my uncles because they were the more poetic like look at the sunlight on the, the back of that deer, you know, where the, the women are just doing their thing and getting it done before dark. And um, so I really love to have um, uh, many, many relatives. I have a huge family. And so the book covers some of those memories um, and, and as well as my hope for, for better farming in the future. I, I, I really do believe it's my responsibility um, not to just maintain the status quo of agribusiness, but um, I feel a responsibility to um, create a thriving agriculture. And uh, I've just met the most wonderful people and um, you know, the 
being an organic uh, person who cares about the land. So there's people, it's just people, but the, a lot of um, support and help that I've been getting. And it's just obvious that I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. Do you write at the farm? Yes. Yeah. I do. <laughs> I'm never not writing, right? Even if we're driving, we are writing, right? The writer's in the audience, you're always thinking, and, and you do have to pull over and, you know, if you think, I'm never going to remember this. This is such a great line. By the time I get out of the shower, I still can't remember it. But you just, um, sometimes you do need that space. So I met Athena when we, we both um, were in a couple other uh, Mallard Island writing residents um, for three years in a row. We were lucky to go to Mallard Island and Rainy Lake and write all week long. And you do need that distance sometimes um, from your local environment to put it in perspective, you know, and draw out what is meaningful versus what's just an image or a memory. Mm -hmm. you know, how, how does that overall art? So my book is meant to be read from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And people think that poetry books, you can just open, and you can read a couple and then, you know, but it really is meant to go from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. I would think. Mm -hmm. I like that you do. But they all do stand alone. And, that's so and they do. They have to stand alone. That's the challenge. You know, I am a failed novel writer because <laughs> I'm like, it's year eight and I'm still in this novel. And I'm like, what? You can write a poem in a day? And, you know, that was awesome. You know, but it, it's a lot trickier than you think. Um, you know, it takes a while. And, and poem placement matters because they play off each other um, and influence each other in these intensities of art. And it's a bit like an opera sometimes, you know, there's these highs and lows and, and resting points. And, and just being confounded by news, you know, even though you, you know, you're not, you're never a, away from the world, even though you're all alone and you feel. It's, it gives you an opportunity to feel like you're in the world and all is happening and, and wondering what's all about. Any more questions? Otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up. And well, okay, I'm dominating. I'm sorry about no, that. No, no, I'm really curious, like, I love hearing you both in your voices read mm -hmm. your poems, and do you have audio books of yourself reading? Not yet. I it's on the list. That's it's, it's a good reminder to get that done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it is, it's weird, too. I, I've had um, other poems, um, like the Missouri Review, they hire an actor, actress, to read your poems, and then you can go on the road. Like, it sounds so strange that that's not me reading my own poetry, but brought to life by our people that do it. It's, it's, it's fun. But I, yeah, an audiobook is in the works. Were, were you happy with the way this other person read your work? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like I said, it's strange, but... Um, because as I was listening to you in particular, uh, the way you were reading your own words, it was not how I would read the words. Sure. But the voice, the, the voice I would come up with in my head did not match. I, 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 I love hearing other people read my poetry. I, th I think that's a real gift to hear other people it read is. yourself. And the other thing I notice is if I hear a poet read and then I read their poetry later or I come back to their poetry, I can't hear it in the way I originally heard it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? All of a sudden that poet's voice is just, you know, well, has usurped your inner ear. Homer would come back and read my book. 